It's the only wrestling podcast on earth with two former Major League Baseball players, Dimitri Young, who's here, Jason, who's not, one four-time Stanley Cup champion, and Darren, who's not here, one rock star, and Lars, who is here. Petey Williams is uh, off doing some Petey Williams stuff, so he's not here. But, guys, I listen, Kurt Angle interview, phenomenal. I'm more excited for David Marquez, who uh, it, there's not many people I follow but Dave is one of those guys that I, on Facebook, I follow him. I, I love his feed. He is one of the most genuine, caring, nicest guys on earth. And to be able to sit down and talk current wrestling, his business, I'm excited. So, Dave, thank you so much for stopping by. Well, thanks for inviting me. No one's ever introduced me like that. I kind of choked up. Thanks. <laughs> In wrestling, you don't you don't you don't get that that type of uh, acknowledgement. So thank you. <laughs> I I first became aware of you through uh, Championship Wrestling from Hollywood. I became a friend a uh, friend and a fan of Johnny Laquasto through there. Sure. So let's let's start there with the journey into Championship Wrestling for Hollywood because there's millions of promoters out there. How do you take a company? And I don't even know the origins of it. I picked it up when it got on TV. But how do you go from maybe an indie company to a televised company? Man, um, that's a hell of a journey. I've been doing this for 30 years. Um, uh, it really starts in the 90s. Uh, I want to 93 or 94. Um, uh, I ended up in Springfield, Missouri, working in local television. Um, and... Uh, uh, prior to that, uh, I grew up around the Olympic Auditorium here in Los Angeles because my grandparents uh, kind of were in charge of the concessions. So I was down there a lot. Um, and I didn't necessarily grow up liking wrestling. I wasn't a wrestling fan like most people are. Uh, I wanted to be an animator. I wanted to go and work for Disney and make cartoons. And, uh, and then when the pencil became obsolete, like in the mid eighties, when I was wrapping up high school, uh, computers were in and no one really told me that you still had to know how to use one of these uh <laughs> to to do computer animation and what really killed it for me was the year the jetsons movie came out i remember on television there was a special uh with bill hannah and joe barbera talking about how these computers did this scene in the jetsons movie and i'm sitting here staring at these old guys like man i've never even seen a computer like in 1988 or whatever. So it totally just took me off course when I got into video production instead uh, and then got into working in, in broadcasting and stuff from there. Um, but in Springfield, I was working for a, a TV station and the time became available, uh, came back to the station as local time. And while we were talking about programming, how we can fill the time, whatever, uh, I kind of blurted it out, let's do a studio wrestling show um, and they were like, well, can you do it? And I said, well, this very studio here, as everyone who worked there knew, uh, KYTV in Springfield, uh, Leroy McGurk shoot, shot uh, that territorial wrestling in that same studio. So uh, it kind of made sense to me. It didn't last too long from the station standpoint because the time went back to the network. But I started a company called World Legion Wrestling with Harley Race and Gordon Soley. And um, they uh, they really nurtured me into virtually what I've done today. Uh, hell of a learning tree to be sitting under, especially during that time. Um, and uh, Harley had ties to WCW, of course, and Gordon Soley's ties to uh, WCW, the NWA. That's how I got associated with the NWA. Uh, Gordon kind of made me join the NWA uh, then. Um, that's a whole different saga. Uh, <laughs> but I was an owner in the NWA from about the mid nineties uh, until about, uh, I don't know, maybe seven or eight years ago after we had it stolen from us in a, in a horrible lawsuit. Um, but uh, because of my knowledge there, if we fast forward quickly to finish that piece, uh, I helped Billy Corrigan purchase it uh, because I knew where all the bodies were buried. Um, so, so that's how Billy ends up with it. But the, we were on television and we stayed on television. Uh, and because of that, and, and I was doing you know uh, college sports for ABC, um, going around the country, uh, be, learning how to, be, becoming a director uh, and a producer and whatnot, uh, freelancing for WCW, freelancing for WWF, uh, helping Corey Macklin every now and again with Memphis Wrestling because it was in the area, um, and uh, Jerry Jarrett and stuff. Uh, I came back to California 
in uh, 99. And uh, uh, because WCW dried up, I got tired of Missouri. Harley Race spot me out. He changed the company to World League Wrestling, which still exists today, which I'm really happy about. Um, and so getting back here to LA, my first gig, uh, wrestling gig, I went to work for Disney at, uh, at Disneyland um, in broadcast services and guest relations and a couple of other things just to have a gig. And then immediately Terry Taylor, uh, who was working at WWF at the time, he's, he's back at WWE now, um, he sent me to Ultimate Pro Wrestling ran by Rick Bassman. And, um, you know, they were, they were development territory for the WWF. And uh, that's where John Cena came from. I directed the very first John Cena promos ever. Uh, and um, so, yeah, so that's where my Southern California wrestling roots come in. And, um, you know, it moves on into what I do today. So every incarnation of televising UPW went into this little company called Epic Pro Wrestling out here, went into, um, uh, uh, I produced and directed XPW, uh, which was just a mind boggling experience from a, from a guy like me who uh, is, is not the Rob Black type uh, to, to be in his office every single day with everything that goes with Rob Black. Um, uh, and trying to create a wrestling broadcast with Kevin Kleinrock, uh, uh, a great guy. But, um, you know, that led to me. Co uh, and then I was vice president for five years of New Japan Pro Wrestling, and I ran the original LA Dojo. So Carl Anderson and Finn Balor, uh, Samoa Joe, uh, Rocky Romero, uh, TJ, little, little, little TJ per Perkin at 17, 18 years old. Um, uh, 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 Carl Anderson, I'm not sure if I said him, uh, Alex Kozlov, Bobby Quantz. All of those guys came out of my time there and recruiting. Um, then that is actually led me back into doing television because, and back into the NWA, uh, because Anoki, Antonio Anoki, was the NWA member in Japan. And so I became his proxy and I was sent to the meetings and I already knew some of these guys. Um, and then California became available and I just applied for it and I became the California territory owner. Um, and I had two votes which was a very big deal in the nwa i represented two people and one was a very powerful person so um i remember being at a meeting once and seeing the books of the nwa at the time uh and it wasn't broke there was money there uh and i just thought it was kind of petty that um you know uh you have these small companies or, or small small time promoters who will look at a thousand dollars or six thousand dollars and it's like seven eight nine million dollars to them and there was there's all these tens of thousands of dollars and i felt that we could like create a common television show uh and we had some people in the organization who had uh, experience uh with local television and national television too and they were telling me that it would never happen no tv station would ever accept a, uh, a local TV show, especially in a big market like LA, New York, or Chicago. And I said, yeah, really? And I produced one and we did NWA Championship Wrestling 10 years ago. And uh, 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 it's been on ever since. KDOC is our, is our home in Los Angeles, Channel mm. 56. Um, and then across the country, as of today, we're on 302 television outlets, whether it's satellite cable or broadcast stations. So, that's how this all came back and me still doing this. But to this day, I, I produce other things. Uh, I direct other things, uh, MMA, boxing, uh, uh, baseball, basketball. I, uh, I did NCAA two college uh, baseball and basketball for years for ABC Sports and, and stuff like that. So, uh, and no, don't think that about baseball. I know much about baseball. It was everybody else around me. I just knew, knew how to make the pictures make sense on television. <laughs> Um, you know, um, so I, I saw some of those early UPW shows, and I, I think yeah. you, where where, where were, were they at the the Roxy or they were at the Galaxy. We did do no, what, we did do well. We did do one or two at the Roxy too. That's, that's what correct. I thought because I, I was down there um, uh, with my band making a record, and actually I, I remember when John Cena he was the prototype, and there was a guy that's working right. the, the big swag. Um, that's right, manager. Yeah. Right. It's, yeah. He was able to, 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 cause we had, at that time we had a, a, this radio show called Rancid Radio and right. I came down and I interviewed John Cena when he was still the prototype. And uh, he, he always told me later on that that was his first ever 
uh, interview that was out of the gimmick, you know, because he was like yeah. the Terminator kind of thing. And um, I remember a lot of those shows and, and also the XPW shows. The first time I ever saw the Olympic or went to the Olympic for a wrestling show, because I used to go down there for, for music shows or whatever, sure. um, was an XPW show. So I, and I had, I, I did not know that you were involved with XPW. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that because that was like the, the extreme, you know, sort of uh, barbed wire death match, baseball bat, light tube, that kind of like what they say would call garbage wrestling. Um, sure. <laughs> yeah. So, and I remember being out in some sort of cow pasture or rodeo place in Southern California where they did a big outdoor show. Vampiro was on the oh, show. P P uh, Pico Rivera. Pico Rivera. Yeah. So yeah, we went down there and saw that. I think Sandman was on the show and things like sure. that. So, um, you know, when you're, when you're trying to capture that kind of like uh, wrestling, is it, a, is it kind of a different <laughs> concept? Like what, well, there, there's your dog. Yeah, he, they dance. Hey, flex. Producing a show like that is is it a lot? Is it um, what what are the major differences? Would you say like a, uh, like a like a more extreme show versus yes. a traditional television broadcast? Yeah. Um, uh, if the if the bottom line is broadcasting and getting it on the air, that's the most difficult thing to do. Uh, th th that we have the hurdles we have to go over just with the FCC stuff. Um, uh, capturing the show and producing the show, it's virtually the same. Um, th there's not much different when it comes to that. Uh, it does, when it <laughs> fundament fundamentally of uh, producing uh, segments, you know, a lot of people don't want to follow rules, uh, timing, uh, 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 stuff that goes into making a TV broadcast. Uh, th those are really the two real distinct differences. Um, because promoters are usually crazy anyways. So you always have to deal with that. Um, talent, for the most part, understand what you're trying to do, but they are still uh, not necessarily the biggest star uh, and have had the experience of Madison Square Garden or a Staples Center or LA Sports Arena or Forum or the Olympic Auditorium type of an environment. Um, so you still have that greenness sometimes when it comes to certain talent, not wanting to pay attention. But uh, if it was just for like a DVD release or a, a VHS release, you know, we, we just we just went ahead with it and cut it down. Uh, so it makes sense for, a, you know, a three and a half hour show on home video would be OK. Yeah, Because a lot of those XPW shows were released on DVD or. That's right. Because of the, the owner. Obviously That's right, because of the video distribution <laughs> <laughs> that he later became very infamous for. Yes, um, yes. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so, you know, that's the most difficult part for me is when we're trying to time an hour broadcast. And at the time, XBW did have a TV show. Um, and so uh, translating um, some of the matches and the way that show was formatted, now that I think about it in hindsight, you know, you got more of the Rob and Kevin show, uh, Klein Rock, the Dorco dude stuff um, uh, on air and the wrestling was way more uh, compacted in, within those segments uh, because we couldn't show a lot of that stuff, um, just in general. And, and especially the way, you know, women were portrayed, not, not from the context like it is today, just with what they were wearing and what they were doing and that kind of stuff. So uh, th that's really, that was really a difference, just the censoring stuff. It's kind of funny to think, you know, early 2000s is, uh, you know, 1956 <laughs> or 57, but it still kind of plays the same way. <laughs> Hey Dave, um, I'm a big, big I, I watch your show. I actually record it so I can watch it Sunday morning. And what it reminds me of, I, I was a military, Navy brat. We moved all over the place. And when I got into wrestling, we were living in Montgomery, Alabama. So they had continental wrestling on with the sure. Armstrongs and, and that production. It just really drew me in because you had NWA wrestling that came on TBS, which was my favorite. Then you had the cartoon WWF, and you also had, you know, the local wrestling. And so when I moved out here, moved back out here, actually, because I went to high school out here, and we've been doing a podcast, and I've been watching your show at, at one, 1 in the morning. But this is a great production because I love the guys on there. You have that one guy, Jordan Clearwater. He was like, he's going to sure. be a star somewhere. And then yeah. you have the um, – the bodegas as the tag team champions. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and uh, I mean, you have a host of other guys, Ray Rojas. 
But anyway, I'm seeing a lot of these guys in uh, AEW Dark. So what is your mm-hmm. relationship with that? Because what I'm seeing, the combat against WWE, a lot of these organizations are kind of turning it back into a territory. And I really like the territories back in the 80s. <laughs> well, it's good observation, but the territories never left. You know, the, the nomenclature went away uh, because it wasn't cool anymore, you know, uh, independent wrestling became the thing because of, you know, Tarantino and Miramax and making independent movies. So that became the thing with Paul E and ECW was like, oh, we're independent. Even though we all find out later on that, that Turner and WWF were paying for everything anyways. Um, <laughs> and the same thing with, with Tarantino, you had the, the Weinsteins and Disney that was paying for everything. <laughs> so, you know, uh, when it comes to territories, I feel it's never went ever anywhere. So if I'm here in Southern California, you still had, you know, Gabe Sapolsky on the East Coast uh, doing stuff. You still had uh, Florida uh, people running down there. And today it's still kind of the same way when you think about it. You have MLW, you have Defy Wrestling up, up in the Pacific Northwest. I'm here. Um, uh, you have Revolution Pro Wrestling, like in the San Francisco area. Uh, and all over the country, you can kind of pinpoint uh, uh, bigger companies that uh, really act as a territory and these people really do bounce around. Um, as it comes to AEW or the WWE for that matter, um, uh, uh, we don't have that close of a relationship anymore like we used to being a local promoter and, and the national show or the, bro- or the, bro- or the network shows, the, the broadcast. So AEW, um, Although I have a lot of friends there in 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 a in a position of power, uh, I don't really talk to those people too often. Uh, I don't know Tony Khan at all, but Christopher Daniels, who's in the office, I who I do know, uh, uh, Cody Rhodes, uh, who I do know, and the Young Bucks that I do know. Uh, but I I just don't. It doesn't work that way uh, anymore. Even the WWE, they have their own intranet casting site where. And they'll just put out an all call with people who are on their their uh, uh, their version of Facebook, let's say, uh, their casting page, and uh, they'll they come to Southern California looking for a strong man or a hillbilly or uh, whatever. Um, and then you just kind of answer that this is me. Send your your you know they submit it that way. So they don't come to the local promoter as much as they used to. Um, so, uh, but the the great thing about uh, our programming and what uh, and my uh, reputation in wrestling is that I have a good one and people know that they can depend on the people that come from a uh, championship wrestling from Hollywood type of a show or the United Wrestling Network. Um, and uh, the older uh, people that are there, uh, again, from a Terry Taylor to a Bruce Pritchard to Triple H and all these others, they know what we can do and how we can do it. So um that's virtually it. They, they call every now and again when they need a, a pretty big favor or they want to see someone do something. Uh, on our primetime live show, the pay-per-view series we just did, we had a couple of phone calls there where maybe it would have been out of the ordinary to see certain talents doing certain things on our show, but that was because they wanted to see them do that and evaluate the, the talent. Well, you know, um, I see, I live in the San Francisco Bay, Bay Area. I, I was born and raised here, so... My first uh, exposure to wrestling was big time wrestling. Sure. And, uh, and then of course the WWF, because I think big time wrestling was out of the picture, probably 82, 81, 82, something like that. That's about right. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I, you know, and I got a chance to go like to the San Jose Pacific and I had Polynesian Pacific Championship Wrestling come through. Sure. The- okay. Most of the promotions came through here. And um, uh, one of the guys that, that's wrestling, uh, for you now is, is, is a guy that I saw his very first match and seen him grow. And I'm so happy that you, that you can see, see the talent in him is Levi Shapiro. Sure. Ooh. He's our TV champ. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So this kid, I mean, I saw his very first pro wrestling match when, when uh, I, I don't think anybody sh- showed him what, a, what, what a gym was, but um, he eventually <laughs> found out what that was. <laughs> and uh, I mean, this kid has got something special, I think, and i always thought, and also like seeing Fat Boy on your programming. So a lot of these guys that I've seen uh, in, your, uh, in your promotion, which I'm totally happy about, is I've seen them on the, like, the indies up here. 
because uh, there sure. is the APW up here, and then there was another sure. uh, uh, big time wrestling. I forget. I think it was yeah. out of Hayward. Well, Florida. there's uh, th there's West Coast Pro Wrestling now, who's our partner, our television partner up there. We've co-produced. It's a championship wrestling show here, but it's on KGO, uh, oh, it KGO? Uh, tonight. I think at two a.m. Yeah, we're on KGO. Okay, well then I, th that's good to know because what I've been trying to do is catch like the the, the ones I think they're on Fight TV. Yeah, it's the same show. It just has local hosts and local talent. Gotcha. Uh, okay. Levi Shapiro is the, the is the co-host actually. Oh, that's great because yeah, no, I mean yeah. he's super talent. So um, you know, a lot of these guys that that I see on your show are for, are California guys. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And is it important for you to kind of nurture? you know, uh, these guys that are coming through the, Cal you know, f coming up from California? I think it is. Um, it, California has such a difficult time in wrestling, and it always has. Um, you know, uh, it, I, I think it's because California is just so accessible. There's so, since I've traveled the world doing wrestling, and I've met so many different types, and probably you too in music, you probably will understand what I'm saying, that in California, that California chill uh, demeanor is, is kind of a detriment when it comes to business sometimes. So it's not as aggressive because it's like, uh, yeah, yeah, you hear people come to California, they're, if they see the ocean for the first time, it's the biggest thing ever, but you've seen it your whole life. And it's just like, oh yeah, that's, I never go to the beach or no, I never go to the mountains. I never, I never do that. No, I stay at home. I don't do anything. And I mean, I just went to Alcatraz the first time like a year ago, and I've you know, right? Seen it, like, <laughs> and I'm 49. You know what I mean? Like, I, yeah, I yeah. I'm, <laughs> I, I'm 47, and it's like I've never been to Catalina, <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's right there. Like, it's literally right there. <laughs> so, it's hey, like, don't get me uh, started with the islands. <laughs> I have a story after you finish. Okay, cool. <laughs> and uh, and so you know, I just feel that they're not aggressive, uh, the talent to go out much like the guys in New York or in the South who want to get out of the South. So when you kind of live in luxury, you you never go anywhere or do anything, and it takes they will never knock on a door for an opportunity. They're the ones who feel that someone should knock on their door, and so that's why too, and it's not necessarily a good thing. You see so many people on my programming who are the same people for so long. It's because they won't take advantage of mm -hmm. their networking. Adam Pierce, as we now see as of the other night is in the main event of the red or of the Royal rumble for the universal title at the WWE. He was our world champion forever, but he's, he's from Chicago. He came here and he dominated for a decade, uh, California and the West Coast. And then he became the head of Ring of Honor, you know, and all that. He, he figured out what he had to do and was hungry enough to now become the on-air figurehead. And now in this match, after being in wrestling for 20 years, I feel that people from LA or, or California in general will look at that and be like, yeah, but I can't do that. You know, it's just, I think they're so landlocked in paradise uh, so, yes, to answer your question, it's extremely important for me to get the Ray Rosas and the, the Eric Watts and Tyler uh, Bateman, who came in from Oklahoma, but he's here, he showed who he is, and now he has a job at Ring of Honor, you know? So it, it, it's this odd mentality that kind of kills me. Um, so, so, yeah, it's, it, but it's extremely important to try to push Californians. Uh, Peter Avalon has been a... A, a passion project of mine for uh, going on probably 13, 14 years now. Um, uh, pretty Peter Avalon, he's finally that again, but it took him a solid decade to understand that he's not this loppy, flimsy kid. Like in his mind, he couldn't, he didn't have the self-esteem to be like, no, I'm, I'm the star of a TV show that's on, you know, at that time, 250 TV stations. He never looked at it from that vantage point. And I was like, well, look, let's change you. Let's do, let's change some things. Him and Ray Rosas were tag team forever, forever. And I was like, no, let's completely change you. Grow a mustache. And he looked at me and he was like, I have to wear this in real life though. I can't wear a mustache. <laughs> I was like, oh, come on, grow a mustache. <laughs> and he has such expressive eyes and he looks like a Muppet. And it's just fantastic from a character standpoint. That's probably my animation background talking, but uh, but it's just like, I knew there was something there with him. He could talk. He got, he was a really good wrestler uh, from an amateur standpoint, 
that I knew he had the performance in him. But after 10 years, he gets a real job and he's with AEW full time, you know. So, you know, that stuff makes me proud to see those guys do that. And they start out with us. So, yeah, I beat them up, too. It's 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 really tough love when people are with me. Some like it, some really hate it. <laughs> How- hey, Dave, I want I wanted to mention NWA power before the pandemic. Oh, sure. Began. That was absolutely awesome to watch. You know, that good old fashioned studio wrestling. And yep. and you and you always seem like the real fidgety. You know, interviewer, but I mean, they put on quality matches. It was fun, and I mean, I know you had a lot to do with it. Was that was that a fun project for you as well? Sure. I mean, NWA Power was a uh, it was an interesting project from the beginning. Um, I had known about the studio there uh, at uh, Georgia Public Television because I wanted to do a local Atlanta show for a while, uh, much like Hollywood, because like we also produced Championship Wrestling from Arizona which is its own show and its own cast and it has a different flavor. Um, and so I wanted to do the same thing in, uh, in Atlanta. And I knew about the stage. And when Dave Lagana came to me asking, you know, what can we do? They wanted to shoot it in Nashville originally. And I was like, I know a spot in Atlanta that I think is pretty dope that I think we could do something cool at. So we went down there, they went down there, they checked it out. Billy liked it and we did it. And from a operation standpoint, in a creative standpoint, in the in the first, uh, you know, I think two uh, two tapings, we had an amazing backstage. I'm not even talking about the people on camera, people backstage working as agents and producers and uh, Jim Cornette for what the public may think about him, whatever. I'm a Jim Cornette guy. Uh, Jimmy Cornette was so invested in this project in the beginning that. He, he nurtured people, he talked to them, he put matches together, he helped them. Uh, we had uh, Ricky Morton working as an, as an agent. Um, Pat Kenny was there as an agent, who's Simon Diamond. Um, uh, Bill Behrens was back there producing, I was producing. Like There were so many people working on that show that it was just amazing. And especially the, the, the people who were visiting that just popped in who live in Atlanta, you know, that just wrestlers, I turned around like, whoa, what are you doing? Wow, I haven't seen you in a while. Boy, what are you doing here? Type of a thing. So no, but it was great fun. Uh, I originally was going to direct that show. I wasn't supposed to be the host. Um, and uh, uh, Billy called me Corgan and he asked if I would be the host. And I was like, well, uh, I was going to do the broadcasting. So he goes, no, I think you, you, you might be better off out there and the people know you. And you know you blah 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 blah. So I did it. I also didn't know they were going to make me the ring announcer. The only reason they did that, I've never ring announced before, and I hated it. Uh, the only the only reason I they had me do it was to save money, not to hire another person. <laughs> um, but <laughs> but that's why I did it. And I guess it got over because people liked it. So my understudy at Hollywood was Jim, Billy Trask. I taught him how to direct. He directed the Hollywood program, the Arizona program, and so Billy Trask was then pushed into. Uh, directing NWA Power, um, but it was fun. It was a whole lot of fun. Uh, there, was, there was pieces of me where I was kind of anxious not being in control of the show because it wasn't my show. It was, it was very much Billy's show, um, Bill Corgan from a creative point of view. Um, and so, you know, we had our meetings, we put our input, but once I became talent, that was like the first time I have ever strictly just been talent, like where I didn't necessarily have to worry about you know, payroll or attitude or and I, I helped with it, but when I was asked, but you know, for the, for the most part, I was a producer and, and talent and they gave me what I needed to produce and I did it. And then when I was just, you know, a, a, a piece of hair and glasses, <laughs> I, I went out and did my thing. So yeah, it, it, it was, it was, it was fun. It was a good experience. Due, uh, due to the pandemic, Shockwave is a totally different setup for NWA. What is your involvement still with NWA? Uh, yeah, I've kind of checked in and out of Shockwave here and there, but I, I the first season of Power I was in love with. Uh, and like these guys, I grew up in Georgia. I love the old NWA, WCW. Uh, I was one of those guys that I didn't watch any of the WWE Attitude Era because I was a strict WCW guy. I, that was mm-hmm. where my loyalty was. So when I see NWA come back, I was excited. Shockwave, what what, I, what is your involvement with, with Shockwave? 
I mean, I don't have much involvement outside of uh, the matches that were shot with us uh, f- uh, on the primetime uh, pay-per-view show that we did on Tuesdays. Um, uh, uh, Billy Trask is also putting that program together for them. Um, but uh, outside of the requests that were made uh, for the matches to be shot, you know, uh, for later, uh, we shot all that stuff uh, and, and produced that for them. But um Outside of the creative or anything, we, I, I don't have much involvement in it. We still have a good relationship. It's just that I, when it comes to the shockwave thing, I, I'm not doing much on it. When they come and ask and they need to do more, of course, we're open. <laughs> well, I, ho- I hope to see you back in NWA again, even though I love you everywhere else. I just – you're one of those guys as a on-air person I can't get enough watching just because I know you're a genuine guy. So that's my – it's the last compliment I'm giving you for the show, though. You know, but there's a lot that goes into wow. that. People ask me this. So, so like, I, I, I started in, in television and news. So being a, being a news photographer, not an anchor, not a reporter. And, you know, growing up when I was a kid, which really wasn't that long ago, but, you know, in the, in the, in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, mid 80s, like I said a little bit ago, it was still the 50s in reality. So, you know, you, the Reagan era and all that. So you... If, if you had a microphone when I was a kid, it was because you had something to say, you know, it was, you were not an authority figure, but you were a trusted figure. And growing up, the people that I looked up to were, it was like Walt Disney and uh, Peter Jennings and, you know, people like that. And so in my presentation, I try my best to be tongue in cheek. I try my best to be funny. I try my best to be serious when it has to be. And to sway all that back and forth and the goofiness in a pro wrestling setting, you know, to me, I think it's easier than most. Um, like a lot of people ask me, especially younger people who are who are doing uh, interviews or um, uh, ring announcing or whatever, they ask, you know, like what what makes it you you, you look so comfortable doing it? Like how? It was like, well, you just to me, you just go out there and do it. <laughs> so. And it's because I saw people do that. The, the microphone, there's a way to move it and to finesse it and to hold it. Um, it's kind of like uh, 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 Foul Fellow, Honest John in Disney's Pinocchio, and how he holds his cigar with dignity and he's a bum and there's holes in his glove. But same thing with the microphone, you know, there, there, there should be class to how you hold it and, and, how, and how, uh, how it becomes an appendage. Um, as weird as all that sounds, it comes across on camera the right way, I feel. Um, and, uh, and and that's my shtick when I have it. <laughs> well, that, there's a psychology to it all, you know, is what is- There what is. Understanding. Yeah. 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 And, that's, and you can definitely tell, you know, like, especially with wrestlers and new wrestlers and, you know, it, it's like the grit in their voice. That's what makes it believable because it's life experience, right? So you're only going to- That's right. You're only going to transmit something that you have, you know, yeah. if you don't I tell have, people this too. Transmit. Yeah. I tell people this too. Like uh, if you listen to a, a late thirties or early forties recording of Sinatra singing stormy weather, and then you hear him sing it in, you know, 68, 69 post Ava Gardner. Now there's, there's, a, there's weight to that song and you understand what stormy weather is um, or any other type of a, a love type of ballad or something from a, a young performer and now they're, you know, middle-aged, if not getting older and older. But I know exactly what you're talking about. It's, it's so interesting. And then holding a microphone, like the physical grip, like so many people strangle that thing or yeah. they hold it like this or something. <laughs> or like, It's so weird, uh, the etiquette of, of holding a microphone um, that uh, it, that's the part that, that, that kills me or feedback. Like they don't understand why there's feedback in the room because they're holding the microphone a certain way and stuff. Um, well, yeah, to, no, I try. Go ahead. So I used to notice that with smokers. Like you could always tell who just started smoking because the way that they held That's it. right. Or whatever. That's and it's, right. It's, I, I know it's like a, a, a completely different thing, but yet the same I thing. I totally get happened. what you're saying. Totally. Because like I smoke cigars. And right. if you if you give a cigar to someone for the first time, they have no idea what to do with it. <laughs> Thank you. No clue. Zero clue. Like they hold it. They're putting their mouth. It's like it's sitting weird. They're afraid for it to touch their lip or their teeth. And like the flame, it's like, you know, they're worried about getting burned. It's like, you're not going to get burned. Relax. <laughs> I don't know how many cigars I've started for people. Like, here you go. Just enjoy it. And they're like, what does that mean? 
or would they try to smoke it like a cigarette? I'm like, what are you doing? Yeah, yeah or the or just the... oh, pet peeve. Oh, I can't stand it. I'm like, what are you doing to it? <laughs> I'll, I'm like, I'll just go stand over if there. It gives you, if it makes you happy, keep doing it. <laughs> I don't know about that one. Now, I, before I let Dimitri jump in, D, I know you yeah. got a question. I do have to ask yeah, you. I, I, I want to go back to something you said earlier about how you got into the industry, but you were not really a wrestling fan at that moment. Are you still not a wrestling fan? Have you grown into being a wrestling fan? A, how does how does your journey? Do you still just is it just a business for you still? Uh, truthfully, yes, uh, it is just a business. Um, I've become a fan of the people I've worked with and seeing them and their portrayal of a pro wrestler, um, not just their, uh, their character that they might play now or the incarnation of getting there. Uh, what I've uh, always fallen and been in love with is storytelling. So mm-hmm. Whether it's it's a, a six minute cartoon, Bugs Bunny, Chuck Jones, Chris Freeling, Mike Maltese type of a thing, or if it's a uh, a six minute pro wrestling match or seven minute television wrestling match, uh, that's how I've convinced myself that, that I've reached my goals. Um, I uh, someone made a joke not that long ago that I'm the Hanna Barbera of pro wrestling um, because <laughs> I put out so many so many characters that were either really good or or really bad. Um, cartoon matches or whatever. Um, we, I've not done the math, but we've done 500 episodes of this series. And prior to that, my other shows, I think I have close to six or 7,000 hours of pro wrestling television that I produced uh, on my own. And, and those are all, you know, seven, 12 minute matches. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I think the label kind of fits. <laughs> Well, talking about storytelling, you have two on on the uh, um, championship wrestling from Hollywood. One of it, one of them involves SoCal distancing. I really love oh, yeah. what's going on with them and Ray um, Roas. But the second one involves Nico mm. and uh, <laughs> yeah, and the, and the women's division and not having a women's division. I just love that storyline because he is so airy. He is an a-hole and be dick. <laughs> <laughs> so well, the apple doesn't fall far. <laughs> exactly. Um, but but uh but um the uh the, the whole women's division thing, there's there's a lot that goes into that actually, especially if you know the history of our show. And I've never been a fan of women's wrestling uh in, in recent times. You know, Judy Martin and the Jumping Bomb Angels and going way back, way back, way back. Uh, that's That was a different type of wrestling than what the last, let's say, eight to ten years has produced. You know, outside of the Sarah Del Rey's and Amazing Kongs, um, you really don't have too many really good female wrestlers. And in the last probably year and a half, uh, I was getting a lot of flack from the public about not having as much female talent on the shows. So I went ahead and uh, talked to the creative and was like in our, in our world said, okay, let's figure out a way to showcase more female talent. And I'm happy to say, I think we, outside of the WWE, we probably have more women on our broadcast than anybody um, uh, with the invention of Holston body uh, to, <laughs> to, to, to guide the way. Um, I felt that that could put a lot of infamous, uh, emphasis on female talent and now we're going to have a woman's championship in not too long uh it's no secret that aaron stevens uh from nwa power and uh, before you know uh, uh his uh, uh, sandow Sa- sandow he's he's uh, the head of creative on our programming so he has a lot a lot okay. he should take a lot of credit when it comes to the evolution of that nick bonanno uh, who most people probably know as a referee uh, but he's a real behind the scenes guy and he's actually the executive producer of the show. Now I've stepped down. Um, he, uh, he's actually running the whole show. Uh, and I went to go concentrate on revitalizing the Arizona show and putting my attention towards a uh, primetime live and, uh, and a new project, which I'm very excited about that should be coming out here shortly. Ooh, tease. I like that. Yes. In Memphis. Oh, Ooh. You've just made us all excited. 
so let me let me jump back in now because we kind of at the top of the show was talking a little bit about the pandemic and how it's changed wrestling. How has it changed the way you're now shooting with no fans? You know, we PD's on the show. He's going back to start wrestling, and you know his worry is he's never done this before. You know, he had stepped away from wrestling before the pandemic hit. Now he's coming back. the 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 way matches are set, everything's different. He was a producer at Impact, and he kind of speculated on one of our shows that it might be easier to shoot it because now you can cut when you need to or tell someone to redo that spot because it was botched. From from your standpoint, now how has it changed the way that you look at broadcasting a television show. You know, it's uh, it's not that different. Um, I personally like it better. <laughs> I like it better with no fans there. <laughs> I get a lot of heat for saying that, but it's true. Um, uh, you don't have to deal with them feeling like they're in charge. There's one, you know, when, exactly. when fans are excited and being in it and the moment and all that, that's great. But then there's like that that, that core group of guys that are and women that are always at shows that feel that they can dictate what's going to happen. And, and it, and it really drives me insane. Not that we have to like drown out the audio and, and fix all that, that I don't care about, but you can see them on camera. We shoot in a real intimate setting. So, and it's well lit. So you can see all the expressions or people being, you know, asses like making foul faces and stuff just because they want to like act like they're bored even though there's no reason to be bored and stuff like that um when it comes to stopping and going with no fans that's extremely difficult because there's no cutaway shots Mm -hmm. there's no edit point so uh you know if someone's in the corner let's say just uh, uh, uh something as simple as a sunset flip or something like that so if they're on the outside gonna come back over and there's a trip where they get caught up on the rope. Like, and if we wanted to redo that, that's so difficult to do because how do you replace that? How do you fix the shot? How do you create the continuity without having to cut away and then coming back to a close up to then a wide and then the impact uh, camera uh, on the ground. So that part's very difficult, but what had, I got to say, I don't know if you guys know this. I produced the end of uh, the new Japan strong show. So, um, in that show, they don't necessarily uh, format it like a 48-minute broadcast. They kind of just let the camera roll. If you know anything about Japanese wrestling, they just kind of let it go. So so there's a lot of that. And in the beginning, they were stopping. The talent was just stopping, like in the middle of the match, because they knew there were no people there. And I was directing the show, and I was like, holy shit, why did you do that? Stop. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how to fix this. <laughs> Yeah, I wasn't anticipating this. Um, and then what I did was I put a camera on Kevin Kelly and, and Alex Kozlov so I could cut to something and then go back and, and you know, fix it. Um, uh, since then, they have gotten way better at, at be doing tele- television wrestling uh, for cameras. And it's not just the, uh, the room. Um, Hollywood, uh, we haven't had too many times that I can recall that we've had to stop. And that was one of the reasons why I chose to do the primetime pay-per-view live. Um, I really felt that we needed that kind of hype uh, uh, for a few reasons. One, the guys can't mess up. They have to do it right. They have to perform the right way. Uh, Two, there's microphones everywhere with no uh, 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 sounds coming from the crowd to mask uh, the the sounds in the ring. Um, and, uh, And the fact that it was live created the importance of having to watch it because you never know what's going to happen, even though we could have taped that stuff weeks ago because no one would have seen it. Um, it's just still that that vibe of it being live. Um, even though the, the the power stuff, it really didn't play that way. But, but back to the pandemic, uh, it didn't really uh, uh, knock us down producing the shows or, or cutting in the middle of the matches. What did hit us, and which is why we have stopped production right now, um, on all of our shows uh, outside of the, the strong program because I don't have control over that um, is uh, uh, we were having issues with people coming from and it's no secret uh, if, if AEW had an issue uh, there were some other independent shows in the Midwest and the South where uh, testing was not uh, um, uh, mandatory and so 
when we would we we asked the talent to get a test at home, send us uh, their negative results 48 hours in advance. But if they were on a show prior to that, it takes so long for the symptoms to come up and uh, and to, to show a positive that when they were getting on airplanes and, and landing in California in Los Angeles and getting off and we give them a rapid test at the studio, then they're positive. So that's why if you were watching the prime time program, uh, why the card was changing so much was because we couldn't, people were, were, we would have to take people out for that reason. And, um, oh. you know, I didn't want to keep saying on television that it was COVID, it was COVID, it was COVID. That was already so dominating in the media and television and, and stuff that we just turned it into an angle most of the time of why someone couldn't be on the show. So um, that that's the most difficult part. The testing isn't difficult. Social distancing isn't difficult. Masks are not difficult necessarily, um, but uh, but but other uh, people from out of state coming in or or whatever that that was the difficult part. Still is. Guys. Ooh. Oh, Lars, you got something? I have one more question. If you don't, <laughs> go for it. I, 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 I go for it. T. All right. You've been talking about. You're 30 years in the business, you know, up and down and all over the place. There has to be one, one professional wrestler that, who, who is your guy? Or if you have like certain favors, you know, I, someone boy. that was a big influence or you helped along the way. There's a lot of them. There's not, there's not one guy. I don't have a favorite at all. Um, they're all great people. And um, that's not a political answer either. Uh, it's just the truth. Uh, you're a coach, you know, it's, yes. uh, it, you know, your, your, your players are your players and, and they're, and, and, and it's a, and it's a, it's an ensemble the, the, you wouldn't win games if the team didn't work together. And, um, and that's the same way here. Uh, <clears throat> I have a production people that I'm extremely proud of, uh, at the WWE, Giancarlo Ditmo, who's one of their producers, started on our show, you know, and he does a lot of their uh, bigger video packages now. Um, uh, it, can, it goes on and on and on all the all, all over the place. Um, and when I got in, like, you know, Harley Race really treated me like a son. And, and we had a true father-son relationship where we loved each other and absolutely despised each other. It was, and for decades, it was, it was very, we had a very difficult relationship, even towards the end of his life. It was, it was great, but then it wasn't. Um, uh, 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 Gordon's the same way, <laughs> like, uh, but that tough love from them that rubbed on to me that I got to teach people and work with them. Like Adam Pierce, uh, you know, he's quite possibly uh, uh, my best friend in, in wrestling and in life in the top, if you were to put five people in an, on a table, Adam would always be there. Um, uh, seeing him come up from Chicago with Ace Steel and Danny Dominion all the way through the way to California to uh, Ring of Honor to, you know, five times world champion. And I was there with him all the way around. Uh, yeah, great time. Um, Finn Balor. Uh, uh, I, I love Fribble Devitt. I, I personally paid for, you know, airlines to get him to America so that he can be seen and, and move out there that I believed in him so much um, in, in New Japan. Uh, you know, uh, so, so many uh, people from all walks of, of, of the operation. So there's not one in particular. Uh, I will say from a legend standpoint, someone who was always there for me, uh, in in more modern times, if you want to call it that, maybe the last 20 years, uh, 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 Terry Taylor uh, has always been there for me whenever I needed someone. Um, uh, and Roddy Piper, uh, too, was, was always available for me whenever I needed something from him. Um, uh, when, whenever he was in L.A., I'd always get a call and say, hey, let's go, let's go get a Coke. And he meant Coca-Cola, <laughs> um, at least with me. Um, and, uh, uh, and his, you know, and his, his catch for his piece whenever it came, whoa, his piece whenever it came to uh, 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 him answering a question or whatever that he didn't have an answer to was he to, you know, he said, oh, sweet, maybe Jesus. And, uh, 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 and then he'd go for an hour, an hour and a half explaining to me 
why or what not uh, you should do something. But there's been tons of influences over the years of broadcasters. Um, Jude Okerlin was always good to me. And, uh, you know, the few times that I had to interact with Vince himself, I saw why he's the man he is. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, you know, my dealings with him, his word is gold. You just have to get it. Why is that? Was that Johnny I just saw walk behind you, Dave? LaQuasto? Or, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Roberts? That That's John right. Roberts who just walked by. Hi. It's Lars. Oh, hey, Lars. What's, up? <laughs> <laughs> What's up, buddy? You texted me earlier. Yeah, I know. I texted you earlier. See, um, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so I guess my final question it would be uh, for you, you know, we're, I mean, before this pandemic, we were basically, at least in, in, in Northern California, um, we're sort of at the cusp of this like amazing independent boom. There's so many mm -hmm. great promotions, so many great, so many great wrestlers, so much talent, you know, that would wrestle here and then wrestle over here. And just a lot of these guys are coming to California for the first time. I mean, the Rock and Roll Express, you know, like you mentioned Ricky Morton, it was making me think that he, you know, before it all went crashing down, like the you know the rock and rolls came out here and 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 ta and uh, wrestled on on a on an indie show. Uh, now we're seeing like you know AEW and Impact sort of taking on you know the big guy. At least that's the perception, right? And you have yeah. all these independent companies that also access the same talent pool as AEW. You guys Impact all this, you know. I mean, yeah. do you see this as like a takeover in a way or as a competition or, or, or I mean, like, what is no, your, um, do you think no. it's good to be? I mean, what do you think? What do you think? Like you're, you're I don't gonna... know. It's, 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 it's so difficult. Um, one, I don't think it's oversaturated. That's what a lot of people like to say. I don't believe that at all. I don't believe that either. Um, I believe that there are too many options and the, the nucleus of pro wrestling, of, of, the, of how it's evolved from even the mid 80s to the mid 90s to today is, is so diluted. That's why Jim Cornette gets the problems he, he gets into for stating truth and facts of how you put a show together. Um, Real life, as we've just seen in America in the last five days, let's say, uh, whatever political beliefs are, but just the, 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 the attitudes of individuals and, and their stance on things, we couldn't do that on television today right. in wrestling, where 15, 20 years ago, that's exactly what we would do. <laughs> so, so and because it's real you yeah. know it's 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 real so um the public and wrestling itself like when wcw went off the air the truth is millions of people turned the tv off and never turned it back on because they didn't care for new york wrestling yeah it's just fact and all those southern folks i know those you know 13 14 million people didn't all die uh you know so that's why when Power came back or the Hollywood show in the South, it, it does very well because it's a traditional wrestling show. So it's real weird how the younger generation categorizes things and accepts certain things. It's okay to put stereotypes and messages in feature films and television, but not in pro wrestling. So pieces of that too lies on the talent themselves, much like Peter Avalon not wanting to wear a mustache. Because in real life, he would have to do that. Um, so, you know, people who have been in wrestling, let's say, five to ten years, they it's, it's, it's not fantasy like it should be. It's black and white, which it shouldn't be at all. Um, I can't, I, I, like, much like the missing link on, on, on his shirt. <laughs> like, today, you couldn't do that. You couldn't do a Kamala today. You couldn't. I don't even think today an Undertaker would work uh, premiering today. Uh, the audience would never accept it. Um, like, oh, that's look at the, that's bullshit. The fucking dead guy? Are you kidding me? What the fuck? Like, I'm not that stupid. Um, uh, 
even the Percy Pringle Paul Bearer character would be too cartoony, which is why Holston Body and 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 Howdy Price on our show, you know, I really put it over the top because I feel that there is still enough pro wrestling fans out there who will are those who will two brothers by the, the way? performance. No, <laughs> they sure look alike. <laughs> no, they're not brothers, not at all, not at all. But uh, but yeah, so you know, it's it's very difficult, and I don't think it's competition either, uh, because it's re- wrestling has turned into a billionaire's game. Um, it really has. It's kind of like you know when super rich people get into NBA D League teams or minor league baseball teams or hockey teams or something like that. They have some cash they can, they, they can burn. It's not that big deal. They're having fun. Um, I'm not saying that AEW is doing that necessarily, <clears throat> but on the outside to someone who's in the business who has spent millions of dollars and has got to where I am based on my resources, which is okay, but I didn't get to start with you know a half a billion dollars. I didn't get to start with uh, uh, NFL relationships where I can call Turner Broadcasting and get on major television. You know, I I don't I don't have those resources, and I'm not I'm not faulting them for that. It's fantastic they can do that, but the the end game where it's going, and much like you said, excuse me, the perception that there's competition. To me, and again, I have tons of people over there, and I'm not debating what they do in their business. But I think the majority of the fans will look at, or, the, or the, the, the television industry in general, let's say, if you really pulled everything and put it all together and stripped it down, if they were really competing with the WWE, they would be on Friday nights at eight o'clock against SmackDown. Well, it almost, seems, it almost seems like the role is reversed though. It's as if like these other, you know, WWE programming are are falling, starting to fall on those nights like they used to do, you know, uh, on the same nights as the other promotions. I love Mm -hmm. a grab bag of different, because to me, when when other than the WWF, or excuse me, WWE, I I still have a hard time with this entertaining shit. We're old. I know, I know. (laughs) But um, I like to have, I mean, most of the time that I enjoy pro wrestling, is on the indie on the indie scene like the, the smaller promotions come into my area that's how i really truly enjoy it. i'd much rather go to a show like that than a, than a show in an arena or whatever sure. it is because it's more intimate you get to see these guys working out what they're trying to do and and they and like i said i saw levi you know first match ever you know and then watch him and now he's your your you know television champion you know and that's yeah. like the, the cool thing a connection to this kid or whatever it was maybe i didn't have it right at the first time but i can s- kind of see him grow so that the, so having a large you know i want to just kind of to echo what you said as far as i don't think it's oversaturated at all i think more option in this world especially professional wrestling because there's so many different styles that you can emphasize you know like you said Memf- or uh, the south is different from the north sure. <clears throat> you know yeah, but- when i was in when i was in uh, uh, press and publicity at disneyland right we sell Mickey Mouse, you know, selling Mickey Mouse and selling a headlock is exactly the same thing. Kayfabe is what it is. They don't call it kayfabe there. They call it valuing the magic. And, you know, <laughs> you, it's true. So, you know, you don't necessarily, you don't necessarily go to a Disney park, let's say with your family or yourself, if you like it, to stand in line for 20 minutes on Main Street to take a, a photo with a four foot high girl in a, in a mouse costume. You know, that's not in your head at all. Uh, it still lives there, you know. In wrestling, that is completely gone. It's you know, with 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 social media and whatnot, <clears throat> you know that that guy works at a Kroger or something somewhere in 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 Alabama or something. You know that, right? And so it kills the idea. Like I get on these guys all the time. Make a fan site and make your personal stuff personal, you know. Don't, don't try your best to try to keep some sort of mystique to you because if they can go and see you at Kroger bagging groceries why they, for free, why the hell would they come pay to see you do this other stuff? And, and I really believe that. Uh, it's, it's very difficult. You know, we were just talking about that. Was it the last episode about MJF and how he's changing the game with really selling that hill gimmick where 
maybe he's him, my guy too. Yep. Well, maybe Ooh, him by himself. Nice. <laughs> but but it, it's true because I I and I think I made this case, but him by himself could really change the way and bring back kayfabe, not for us, but maybe for our our kids and their kids, where you have guys like it an, takes everybody else though. Th- well, that takes everybody saying. else though. Guy like an Ethan Page who is really fighting that trend. And I kind of agree with you. If you want to bring back that Cape Vape, which I think it can come back if you get everybody else to buy into it. Sure. Well, I think, I, I mean, the, the world, the world's that way. Go, go ahead, Lars. Oh, I was just going to say, I think there are, there are guys that try to do that. I mean, I don't think, you know, I remember, you know, being somewhere with Kofi Kingston when he was still from Jamaica and he was trying to, yeah. when these kids came up to him and he was <laughs> trying to talk to them, make an accent. You know what I mean? Sure. And it wasn't so long ago, you know? Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I feel like, you know, like you were saying those, it, you know, if you're going to be working at, you know, like your personal pages, these things, I think that 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 suspension of disbelief is lost because the, you know, it's like when The Undertaker started doing this documentary about his life, I was so stoked to watch it. And then after I watched it, I was like, I, I don't have the same feeling towards him, you know? That's right. It's so difficult. So, you know, you hit it right on the head. Uh, Rick, everyone was in awe of Rick Flair until, you know, his social security number became public and he had IRS issues, you know? And then you find out he's adopted and, you know, it doesn't matter. Like, we don't know what really happened at Hugh Hefner's place. We don't know how broke he was. We don't know. He's Hugh Hefner. Like, boom, period. (laughs) <laughs> um so yeah it's so difficult because like with peter i remember peter's avalon the very first time i put him on camera uh and it was on the very first episode of the hollywood program actually uh 10 years ago uh he was in the very first match against colt cabana that was the premier match on championship wrestling from hollywood and i did that because i knew cabana would make peter look good even though he was going under and I knew Peter could play with him and I knew they would do fun stuff. And, and anyhow, the the interview that I had uh, Peter do, I think we did 20 takes of it. And it was a picture in picture type of thing. He was walking to the ring and then his message came up at the top. And the first three were just standard pro wrestling, Colt Cabana, blah, blah, blah. It had no life to it. And then I told him, I said, nope, Peter, you're the biggest man in pro wrestling. And he looked at me and he looked me dead in the eyes and he goes, but I'm not. I was like, no, 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 <laughs> no, you are. That's the, that's the farce. That's, yeah. you know, it's like calling a fact guy tiny. Like it's, it's, you know, you're supposed to, <laughs> you're supposed to be there. And, uh, well, but he caught on, he got it. He was the biggest man in pro wrestling. And then we changed He's from Rancho Cucamonga. And I was like, I don't want everybody on the show to be from, you know, uh, 50 miles radius from where we're at. That's stupid. This is, in my mind, it's a television show. So I was like, you're from, and I was just sitting there. And then, uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, Haas uh, 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 Cartwright popped in my head because I said he was the biggest man. I said, you're from Carson City, Nevada. (laughs) I I don't even know what that is. (laughs) <laughs> my age you'd see that fucking map burn every day on tv yep. so there you are. well you know um, the so, thing about mjf is like i feel like mjf pulls a lot from jim Cornette. i feel he, he you know i can see that because it's like that's his gimmick and that's the one thing that i think why if some of these guys you know he he's matured obviously way quicker he's like a kurt angle and he's Just, still a kid i think he's only 21 oh. he's yeah. a kid that's that's insane to me that he's figured it out, you know, like that. And he was able to. Well, draw have you guys. have you seen the videos of him on like Rosie O'Donnell when he was five? Before? No, I have. Yes. What, dude? Yes, it's 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 badass. So uh, he was going to be like a singer or something. Like his, I know his grandfather was a big band leader, like in the Catskills and stuff. So that era of uh, of entertainment, forties, uh, fifties. And so he grew up with all of that. And so he and I kind of bonded with that because I like all kinds of music. But if it, if it's jazz or, or, you know, Harry James, whatever, to me, that's great. Um, and uh, he told me about his grandfather. And so uh, 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 we found this him on the Rosie O'Donnell show, the talk show. And there's little Max uh, Friedman. And 
I, I, he won a contest, I think, a singing contest or something. So he ended up, he came on the show and he has all the moxie and all the attitude. And he's like four years old and he's talking shit to Rosie O'Donnell just like he's doing <laughs> now. And it's a complete act. And it's so good. And like at the end of the interview, he looks at her and he goes, so can I go? <laughs> like, wow. <laughs> this is a four-year-old. <laughs> Wow, it's it's like it's like in in my business. It's it's it, you know when we're making music, it's we're, you don't want to be a, a copycat, an identical copy of somebody, right? You you and and I think um, bands or whatever it is. When, and same with wrestlers, it's like we can pull from these guys, and we might think that we're copycatting them, but we're actually you know there's something else being created that's that's different and it's it's new and it's fresh and. And, and uh, I think the best wrestlers today do exactly that. And it's like a subconscious thing. It's like, they're looking at guys, they're getting you know, hints or whatever it is. And then they're bringing out themselves, but with this element to it. So um, do you see that as well? And if so, with the talent that you work with, do you, how do you guide them? I just try to pull out their real selves and and motivate their confidence like with mjf too you know max uh i met him i think when he was 19 um and uh and i pushed him like crazy and i was like do this do that the, the best thing i told him to it had actually happened i said you need to do something i need to figure out how to get you and Col C cabana together and you do a bit where he's your dad I was like this <laughs> this is just perfect and they did it in chicago at freelance wrestling it was great they did weeks of this that Colt cabana was his dad and they would do spots with a catcher's mitt and a ball glove and a ball. <laughs> and it would come down to, 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 to catch. And then MJF would just beam him in the head with the ball. You were never there. You were on the road. Ah! And it was just fantastic stuff. Um, but I, I just try to pull out them. Like Danny Rivera, Danny Limelight. Um, he has, a, like has a very he – has he has a great background when you, when you pull out – where he's from, he's really from Brooklyn. He's really that kid from the block. Um, but when he came to California, he was in the Marines. He was a, he was a drill sergeant, you know, for years. He was a drill sergeant. And it's completely different than the salsa, you know, uh, bodega guy that you see on television now. And it's taken him. He's not been doing this that long. I think he's only been wrestling for seven, eight years. Um but it, but he's re, he's a real student, and he has that military respect that he'll listen to you and he'll take what you're saying at face value, but he'll tweak it so much that it's his. So like he told me about his AEW match that, that he just shot, it hasn't aired yet. Uh, but he told me about it, and I was excited for him, and then, and he was telling me all this stuff, and I was like, well, don't get hurt, like that's silly. <laughs> to do everything you're telling me and so when everything was said and done he just sent me a text he didn't say that he didn't do all that he just said i didn't get hurt <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> um uh, uh, but yeah i just i do my best to pull out their real pieces like the old days and and find bits and pieces of the real them um jordan clearwater you know he's he's as Richie Cunningham, you're going to get. So it, that Opie Taylor music man character, you know, I don't know what, he was so bland and blank when he got here. And if you see the evolution of him and what we've been able to do with him and we gave him Blake Troop as an advisor and as a trainer and, you know, and now he has the golden boot to go with the golden spike and and he has somewhat of a tan the best he can do <laughs> uh, i like his robe his, yeah all that stuff you know all a lot of that was aaron stevens you got to give aaron, that a lot of that was aaron oh. stevens but we've done what we could because he comes from roger ruffin in ohio and so we can actually give him points that he'll pay attention to versus people from california who don't want to hear any direction <laughs> Anybody who comes in from outside of the state, they will always make it first. Always. It's just that way. I don't know. I don't, I don't know exactly why. And I think if I would not have left LA as a kid and worked in Missouri and, 
and other places, I think I would have probably been the same way. Mm. I had to go and experience the dinner table. I had to experience Lutherans. Like I've never seen a Lutheran before, <laughs> you know, I, I had to, I had to see that the assemblies of God and all of these people like that. I'm a Puerto Rican from LA. Like I didn't see any of this stuff. <laughs> um, uh, even Mexicans were weird to me. Like they don't say the same words. Their food doesn't taste like our food. Uh, and I think our food is better and you know, like all that kind of stuff. You don't um, mix your rice and you don't mix it with the beans. That's that's the one thing I see. Right. <laughs> unless, unless it's like arroz and, and, and gandules or something where it's supposed to be that way. But that's party rice. You don't eat that unless there's a party. Because um, <laughs> it takes too damn long to make. Uh, but, but like, it's just, yeah, you just kind of have to pull that. And then again, as a kid, I was, I wanting to be an animator, I feel you have to look at mannerisms and exaggeration and you know like why everyone loves Jackie Gleason for all of that and why you love Red Skeleton for all of that and then on the other end of it Rochester and Jack Benny and you know you, versus a uh, Chris Rock who's fantastic or Eddie Murphy who is fantastic it's just it doesn't have that same quality because it's real but I think it's too real. And the yeah. other part is fantasy. But the problem with that is that the time period that it came out and it's not acceptable, even though the comedy and the intent, like when, if, if people were to watch the Jack Benny program today, I don't think that they would notice that Rochester gets over on Jack every single time. Like they don't realize that. It's just like, oh, he's a black butler and he's doing this stuff for this rich white guy. No, <laughs> he's beating the shit out of Jack for that half hour whether it's on radio or, or the or the black and white show. So, you know, those are the tough parts when I when I watch a lot or when I see a lot of society and where it's gotten today, which I understand, there's a lot of ugly for sure. But um the the, the, the basics of storytelling, you still have to have a bad guy and they still have to have traits. And uh, w w whether the color of the skin is there, that's a that's a conversation, but it shouldn't be uh, the doorstop. Man, Dave, I gotta tell you, we've gone way beyond our time. I have at least two more questions. <laughs> Seriously, I should have held up the pencil. <laughs> I love it. I I love it. We have to have you back on. I mean, Dimitri, Lars, we're both smiling. This has been a great talk, right, guys? Oh, this is Absolutely. awesome. Uh, yeah. Dave, thank I, you. Hopefully, I, I know I said I had one last question, and then fifteen others followed, and I apologize. But it's just it's when you, I mean, that's the one Great. wonderful thing about this this podcast and the thing that we do is like becomes it just it's just a conversation, and you get lost in it. So thank you for bearing with us. Where can people no worries, find, man. I dig it. Where can people find you? Find Championship Wrestling for Hollywood United. Anything you are doing that you want to? I had to write it down. Um, <laughs> <laughs> And now I have bifocals. So, um, so uh, at CWF Hollywood, at CWF Marquez, M A R Q U E Z, at CW30 uh, Memphis, which is a big, big deal, um, at CWFA, which is our Arizona show, uh, and at United Wrestling. That's all my stuff. Uh, I my um, Facebook page is is public, and I and I have to say this. <laughs> out loud because people think they're going to get the tv personality when they get there uh, it is my page it's my private page it's me it's a person it's david marquez not uh, david marquez the guy on television so if you're coming for wrestling news or just talk about wrestling or entertainment that's probably not what you're going to get um <laughs> very opinionated very open with my thoughts and um and i don't hold back on the adult words so uh it's uh, uh it's it's very real and a lot of people can't handle that you know it's that uh sh shut up you don't know anything about that you know you're just a wrestling promoter like, no i kind of live here and pay taxes too <laughs> <laughs> i'm hoping we get a concession stand brawl here from memphis <laughs> I, I i'll put it this way we've been on the air in memphis for two years it's a uh uh, the championship wrestling presented by Pro Shingle. You can find that on YouTube. It's basically market specific uh, uh, broadcast. And we went to Memphis uh, to try it. And uh, it's hosted by a couple there, a great couple, uh, Dustin and Maria Starr. Um, and uh, 
uh, we're on CW30, uh, I think at noon uh, in Memphis. But the great part about this show is that for two years, the public in Memphis has taken to it. It's it, And it's the Hollywood stuff, by, by the way. Then we launched it in Houston on the ABC station there. Then in San Francisco uh, with James Kincaid, Bimbo Jimbo, and uh, Levi Shapiro, and it's on KGO. And it's like, it's funny, I throw these call letters out, and I'm sure people listening to this don't get it. Like, KGO is the number one station in San Francisco. It's just like being on WABC in New York or KBC in Los Angeles or WLS in Chicago. Like, it's a big, big deal uh, to have landed a channel like that. And uh, anyhow, the Memphis show, this is kind of a first here, and I might get in trouble depending on when this airs, but we've been trying our best to do local matches. COVID has stopped that uh, forever. Now we have a facility. Now we're going to shoot local matches, and Memphis Wrestling will return on CW30 in Memphis uh, with local matches, and I'm very excited about that. And uh, and I hope to launch more of these around the country. Um it's very exciting. San Francisco will be next with the West Coast Pro Wrestling. We're working on shooting specific matches for the area and having their own broadcast. Not that I want to take away from what we're doing nationally. It's just important to get the local flavor. Like when you watch the old WWF shows or primetime wrestling uh, or all-American wrestling, and you'd see the parquet floors at the, at the Boston Gardens or uh, the Maple Leaf Gardens had that long ramp and the ring looked like trash. It's like you knew uh, you, you, you knew you were watching something different and the vibe was different. And I do think each area does offer different qualities and different things. So, stuff from Southern California, you'll, you'll watch things in which why it gets a lot of heat is because it's such a hybrid of athleticism or um, uh, gymnastics and lucha and some wrestling, you know, traditional wrestling stuff. And uh, all over the country, it's different. Well, if you ever need a 49-year-old heel manager that looks good on film, give me a ring. You got it. I'll tell Scott and John. <laughs> hey, if you need a Willie Mac stunt double, here I am. <laughs> I, there's nothing else I can do but wrap this thing up, guys. I'll keep the promote. <laughs> I, I will keep the promoting to a minimum. We've got our new Instagram page, Wrestling Perspective Pod. Go like it. Our YouTube page, which is blowing up, go make sure you subscribe. The Kurt Angle interview is up over there. Love it. Enjoy it. Dave, thank you, my friend. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dave.